Test, test. All right, what up, everybody? We're about to get started. I'm about to hit record. Just messing with a couple settings here. Okay. First episode today is about... Mix mistakes. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen mix mistakes. What an odd number. Let me think of one more. Let me make it fourteen. In fact, let me think of two more so I can make it fifteen. Fifteen mix mistakes. Fifteen mix mistakes we all make. Hold on. Test, test. I'm also checking my mic. Hello, hello. Okay. Let me think of a few more, a couple more mixed mistakes. If you are in the comments, if you want me to talk about a specific mistake that people make, if you want me to talk about it, let me know. Otherwise, I have already 13 on my list. Let me think of like two more. Um... All right, I think I got something. Maybe one more. Mistake is. What's a what's a common mix mistake? One more common mix mistake. Things people have a hard time with. Uh, yes. 
controversial one. Okay, we're going to get started. I got 15 mixed mistakes that we're going to start recording here. If you are on Instagram, hello. Come join us on Twitch or YouTube. But I'm going to start recording here on the computer. All right, here it comes. All right. Hello and welcome back to the Mix of Music podcast. I'm your host, DK, and today Lou is not with me today, but we have 15 different mix mistakes that you may be making right now. Mistakes that you might be making every single time you mix. Things that I want to directly address. Things that you may find, habits that you may find yourself falling into, and hopefully you can get out of them. I mean, the point of this podcast episode is to help you improve, right? So we're going to talk about 15 common mix mistakes that I see quite often. And the cool thing is, is that I haven't done it as much recently, but for a long while, I would, I used to do mix feedback every Friday on Twitch. So I've listened to literally hundreds of songs and trying to tried to give uh, specific feedback on each of those. So there's lots of things that I've learned, lots of patterns that I've seen um, from mixers of all types of levels. And I'm here to kind of talk about those patterns and to kind of help you work through them. There's mistakes that we all make. And the cool thing is, is we're going to address all of them. You're going to go home. Work on your next mix with these in mind. You kind of take and choose information buffet. Just take and choose what you'd like to try. Um, but these are the 15 most common mistakes that I see from young to even intermediate mixers. Sometimes even advanced mixers. So let me know if you, if you have made these mistakes in the past or if you are, <laughs> if you've figured out a way to overcome them. Or if there's other mistakes that you often see other people or yourself falling into. Number one is mistakes with balance. Now, balancing is something that's interesting. With mixers, mixers want a balanced sound, like you're there to balance the mix, but I think balance is the wrong word. If you want everything to be heard, nothing will be heard, in the sense that you're not trying to get every single synth and every single percussion instrument, and you're not trying to get every single, you know, um, guitar part and lick to be heard that's not the point i think a great mix is kind of like magic where a magician will show you one thing with one hand while they do magic with the other they distract you with one hand as they distract you from the other and then they show you the other hand a proper good mix is not balanced with every song that we love, I mean, think back to all the songs that you just love the sound of. There's usually one thing or a few things that really stick out and kind of give that song character. In some songs, it's the rhythm of the hi-hat. I mean, think about Stevie Wonder. It's a lot of like the rhythm of the hi-hat. The groove of the hi-hat is a, a big deal. I think that in some songs, it's the lead synth that's really like almost overpowering the vocal and that becomes the hook. It's a bigger hook than anything that the vocal does. Um, sometimes it's, it's that single effect, like that weird glass shattering type sound, like a background effect that kind of takes the foreground just for a moment and it only happens once or twice in a song, the ear candy, and that's a big deal. Sometimes uh, it's just the vocal and you really bring that vocal out and you kind of make it feel like a proper ballad and you accentuate the importance and the beauty of a proper vocalist. Regardless, I don't think a good mix is balanced. I think there's some confusion about it. I think a lesser experienced mixer will try to strive for balance when honestly balance is relative. Balance does not mean everything is equal. Things are boring when everything is equal. Balanced mixes are boring mixes is a common phrase. And I think that with proper amount of experience and with a little bit of bravery and trusting your gut, which we'll get into a little bit later, I think that you you should allow yourself the room to bring things out that you like more and push things back. <laughs> Especially as a producer and you're doing like, uh, 
This is a pretty common trick. If you stack a kick drum and there's like 10 kick drum samples that you're stacking, if I delete nine of them, I'm probably gonna get that kick drum to hit harder. So be careful with the stacks. Don't overproduce it. Don't over stack anything if you're a producer. Arrangement is super key here. And I mean, it's the same thing with arranging as it is with mixing. Make sure that you properly only put in what is necessary. Um, and again, just, just don't go for balance. It's, you don't want everything to be heard. Some things are more meant to be felt. Number two, a lack of a reference track. Now this is super obvious. This is super obvious. Every speaker system sounds very different. Every headphone sounds very different. Every mix and rough mix sounds very different. If you have no frame of reference, if you don't understand how much top end is too much top end, how much low end is too much low end, how much mid range is too much or too little mid range, then by the time you mix in a void and you send it off to me or to a client, it will not sound anywhere remotely near anything else. Now, I'm not saying that your mixes have to sound like anything else, but if we talk strictly from a numbers perspective, if I hit skip and go to your song randomly, Spotify recommends me your song and I go to your song and it is so bizarrely out of context and doesn't sound right, it doesn't take a pro engineer to realize, oh, this sounds cheap. This sounds feels very cheap and homemade, which sometimes is the vibe, but most of the time it's not. And that's something, honestly, most of the time, nine out of 10 times, it's because you didn't use a reference track. I've heard of old school engineers leave a radio on the entire time, in the back of the room, the entire time while they're mixing, so they always have a frame of reference, so they kind of remember what music is supposed to sound like. We reference in, a lot of mix engineers reference with multiple sets of speakers and headphones, but most importantly, we do a lot of the referencing mix work while we mix so like you can go back to the reference track list solo that listen to that and go back to your mix make sure that the low end is relatively similar or within the within the boundaries of acceptable you know within the within the bullseye the bullseye is pretty big and pretty diverse but the point is you want to give listeners you want to let listeners give the artist song a shot and if your song is so out of pocket that listeners will, won't even give your artist a chance they're like they can't even listen to the lyrics because they're just so dumbfounded with how dark the vocal sounds or how how bright everything is um they're not going to give your artist a chance and that's a disservice to the song that's a disservice to the artist and that's a disservice to the team so with a proper mix you should reference songs that you like. And here's the cool thing about references. One, I use a demo mix, the rough mix as a reference in the sense of they may not even be close to what is acceptable as far as like mixing goes, but a reference mix is really important because if you solo that reference mix and you listen to that reference mix and there's a specific synth part that you're kind of dialing in, you can listen to the rough mix and find out what role that synth played. For example, you may not know exactly how to EQ the synth or anything like that, but you know from the rough mix that the synth is an integral part of the song and it's very loud and it's the main hook. Or you might find out it's a background instrument. Usually with rough mixes, the producer and the artist, if, especially if they're working together, they don't send you stems or a rough mix to start mixing unless they're somewhat happy with the song. They've gotten to a point where there's a vibe. There, There's some sort of... Uh, emotional thing going on that they really like and in order to maintain that oftentimes it's with balance so in order to maintain that balance you can use the rough mix to figure out what roles each track played another reference is just a great song that you like the sound of you know, I typically have a large playlist of some Serb and Ganea, some Manny Marroquin stuff, you know, whatever, some big A S tier mixers, and I'm listening to those, as well as other songs of mixers that nobody's ever heard of, but I just really like the sound of. And it's important to pick songs that you like, that you think will fit well within the context of the song that you're mixing. But I also think that most of your referencing and the homework done is actually going to be done before you even pull up any session. If you are not comfortable with your speakers or you got a new set of speakers, you're in a new room, or even if you just moved your desk and the speakers slightly, even if it's just a few inches, I would take the time to, before you even pull up Pro Tools or whatever DAW you use, to go to Spotify or pull up title or whatever you use and 
just listen to songs that you like. Literally just put in the practice, put in the hours of listening to songs for enjoyment. And then you can hear out of your speakers in that mix position. If you mix on headphones, then you can hear out of the headphones. What are the expectations of uh, accept, socially acceptable low end, socially acceptable top end, socially acceptable balance, as well as mid range, things of that nature. What is too much reverb, too little reverb, different ways of using delays, uh, all that nature. So the referencing, I think, will also come a lot before. And I, I don't think that's going to go into another mistake that people go into, but it's very, very obvious when you don't use a reference now I'm a certified scuba diver and one thing that you learn while scuba diving is first off unless you have a special nitrous nitrogen infused oxygen tank you can't go below around 60 feet there's literally a line in the water where if you stick your head, under, head underneath you will go like fully drunk and people die all the time because they think they're swimming up but they're actually seeing this reflection on the surface floor and they're too drunk to figure it out um, and regardless, even if you are fully aware, one of the things that the instructors always tell you is to watch the one thing that will always help you remember which way is up. And that is watching the bubbles. Now, I love this. I love, I love, love, love this analogy because the bubbles is are always going to go up. Right? They always float to the surface. And, and when you're swimming... You don't ever feel like you're going to be inebriated or you're going to lose your balance or control. You're never going to feel like you're going to lose orientation. Like it's just swimming. But if you're in a really warm, clear ocean, right, You and the sand on the bottom is white and it's reflecting a lot of that sunlight, you'll be surprised how often people will lose orientation and forget which way is up. Because you're just so enthralled in the moment. You're floating. You're flying. And again, it's something that we can't even understand until you're there. But once you're there, I mean, people literally die because of this simple mistake. They're just not looking at the bubbles. So I think a reference mix is a lot like the bubbles. All it's there is to remind you which way is up, to kind of give you back in that right frame of mind, to remind you, oh yeah, this is what music is supposed to sound like. Oh yeah, this is what a good drum, this is how much a drum kit is supposed to be aggressive. This is what an aggressive drum sounds like or a laid back drum sounds like. This is what guitars are supposed to sound like. This is what vocals are supposed to sound like. This is the average loudness of this song, whatever reference you're using it for. But the point is to just remind yourself, because if you mix in a void, you mix in a void with no reference, especially with without experience, without ample amount of experience and um, experience of referencing. That's a big thing as well. You're going, you're going to inevitably, even pro level mixers are inevitably going to lose their orientation, lose perspective. This is a big deal. And it's, it's not something that like it's, it takes skill to recognize when you're losing objectivity. And in the beginning, it just kind of sneaks up on you. You're like, oh, shit. I listened to the mix two days later. And it's like, I wasn't even close to what I thought I was doing. And that's a pretty common thing. So um, using a reference every single mix is very, very important. That's mix number two. It's very obvious when you don't use a reference track because you send me a mix. People send me a mix and it doesn't even sound close to anything like the music made on Earth um, as far as like tonal balance goes. So um, use a reference. Number three is actually very easy and goes hand in hand with that is there's no consistency in your monitoring. The reason why the car car test exists is because most of the time, a lot of us are commuting in cars and we're listening to the most amount of music casually in a car. If you listen to the most amount of music casually in a car, of course, it makes sense to reference in a car because you know what music is supposed to sound like in your car. Let's say that you always switch between headphones and your speakers and maybe a second set of speakers. You turn off and on sound ID or whatever it is. There's no consistency in your monitoring. Then that's going to throw you off each and every time. You should have at least one consistent, super consistent monitoring device, whether that's a pair of headphones or that's the speakers with sound ID on or sound ID off or something similar, right? any sort of correction on with DSP on or off, you have to be consistent. And if you don't have anything consistent, I would go out of your way to make sure you sit in front of your speakers or in your headphones in your mixing position. And again, do that homework and listen to mixes before. Reference mixes before you even pull up any sessions. 
get used to your monitoring, get used to the room. Again, even if you move your speakers just a few inches, you might accidentally put your speakers into a null spot or there might be different resonance frequencies in the room. There's a lot of acoustic stuff going on that is that is above this episode, you know, but there are so many things going on that can affect your listening position. Even just moving back and forth in your chair a foot or two can totally drastically change the sound of your audio. This is another thing that I don't think people are doing enough of. You need to put in the work, put in the reference of getting used to your monitoring system. I think that getting used to your monitoring system is significantly more important than getting a better monitoring system. Now, this is a big key difference. With a better monitoring system, for example, if you have really nice speakers, it's going to, at first, totally throw you off and you're gonna have to learn those speakers, all right, because you're uncomfortable with them. But eventually, um, they provide more detail. They're a lot more clear. You can probably, might be able to hear the transients better. If there's less distortion in the woofers, you might be able to hear um, the reverb tails a little bit better. You might be able to hear more muddiness in the mid-range. There's more information that comes out of them, useful information that comes out of the speakers. But in general, even if you just switch to ATCs from JBLs like willy-nilly and you put them in the room, if without any sort of practice or reference or even get like a getting used to phase of the monitor, you're literally not going to mix better. So make sure you put in the time to listen to mixes listening to songs casually for enjoyment from your mix position. That is a huge deal. Um, number four is gear and preset dependency. Now, I, I don't... Y'all know how I feel about gear. I use it. I love it. But I don't think it's going to change anything. If you suck at mixing, gear isn't going to change anything. And if you're really good at mixing... Gear might help, but it mostly helps in the form of variety than it does in practical application, if that makes sense. So with gear, people are like, I need to have a nice preamp. I need to have a U87. I need to have a C800G microphone. I need to have an LA-2A. I need to do this or I can't record. I can't use the built-in Focusrite preamp. I can't use the built-in UAD preamp. Um, that sort of dependency is going to kill your creative. Uh, the creative side of you, don't don't even think about it. I mean, remember that all these companies are marketing and profiting off of you. So <laughs> don't be in their control. Like you, you are a creative mind. Your creativity is not bound by the marketing efforts of another company. Don't don't worry about it. The less dependent you are on gear, the better. Especially especially on presets. I would not, the, the presets are helpful. Like they help you get to a starting point and then you can tweak from there. They kind of um, make your workflow faster. I mean, you can get somewhere faster. They kind of move a lot of the knobs for you, but there's a lot of people that have their favorite preset or their favorite, even their favorite stack of plugins. I use the same five plugins with the same presets on each one. And a lot of these dogs, you can pull up a, a chain preset a lot of people are over dependent on those presets. So, I mean, I don't really need to explain anything. That's number four. The reason why that's so dangerous is because not every vocal, even from the same artist with the same microphone in the same room, even if everything is the same, the preset is not going to be ideal every single time. You get it ideal once, but in the next song, there are two keys below the original key that you recorded the first one in, which makes them the lower part of their resonances in their chest, in their throat, in their mouth, in their head, uh, come out a little bit more. <laughs> and you want that. So it's not going to be ideal for that just because the key change or they're in a different octave of their voice or whatever. There are different distance from the mic naturally. As I get closer to the mic, there's more low end. And as I get further apart, there's less low end in my voice. You have to, in order to compensate for that, you have to use your ears. Um, it's not going to be ideal. If you're, if you're mixing to make things ideal, you have to put in the work of listening each time. You can start with a preset. Again, presets are really useful for getting that workflow started, getting places faster. But do take the time to adjust for that specific session. If you're using, I mean, if this is recording or for the mixing side, adjust for that session. Again, for that song, it'd be a disservice to the artist if you didn't um, take the time to listen. I mean, you've got the ears, you've got the taste, go ahead and use it. I know it's a little bit of work, 
It's not even that much work. Shut up. I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna let that be an excuse. That's not. That's not that much work. Number five is ear training, and this is a mistake that people make that I want to be clear of. Um, ear training when you listen to pink noise or white noise of some kind, and they boost the comp AI or computer boosts the 500 hertz, 3 dBs, and you can be able to figure that out. That's awesome. Or even if it's actual music, it's not even noise of any kind. Um, the reason why that's not the most useful is because that's that's done in a void meaning what you don't want to like what's not useful is to be able to hear what frequencies are being boosted and cut what is useful is what freak like to be able to figure out what frequencies you do and don't like now there's a difference there to be able to identify them by their number or being able to I, even if you don't know the number you're like I don't like this part of the mid range and you and then you can figure out sweep a little bit to figure out where it is but you already know which frequencies you don't like that when you're doing like ear t ear training like that in the void it's less helpful it's less practical I mean it goes a little bit but you're gonna be surprised how much of that comes naturally from just mixing a song so again it's not about the numbers and I and this goes into when people watch me mix when I live stream the mixes they're like trying to copy exactly what number frequency I'm dipping in stuff even I'm not paying attention to that. I'm literally just paying attention to what sounds I like that I want to boost and what sounds I don't like. I'm not paying attention to the numbers. I mean, if you want me to, I could say that was probably around 650 or something like that. But that is like secondary, even tertiary to what the main purpose was, which is I don't like this part of this synth or this part of this snare drum. And the number is arbitrary, right? So it's more important. Um, I think the quote goes, you know, I can teach you how to make a, a nice snare drum, but I can't teach you what a nice snare drum sounds like. And it's that second part, knowing, understanding what a nice snare drum sounds like. And again, that's that's uh, subjective to you. You have to have, you have a taste that people want to hire, right? Or people like to hear. Um, and that subjective taste is what makes something so great you know is is what makes a mix so great and so unique and so you so don't be afraid to again like don't be don't be don't have any fomo from not doing that specific ear training the numbers and recognizing different frequencies frequencies is just going to come naturally from understanding and learning what you do and don't like okay what are we on right now one two three four five six um Actually, that was number six, ear training, and then number five was ear training, number six was mixing, mix training in a void. Oh, wait, no, mix training in a void, number six, this is another thing it's similar to. Mixing in a void, another way that it kind of hurts is getting practice stems or getting stems from someone is very useful. You, got, you can kind of look at other sessions, you can even see if they even have their plugins on, you can see how they mixed a session, it can be fairly useful. But the problem with mixing practice stems is that you're mixing without a client. And when you mix without a client, what is the end result? Because there's no such thing as an objectively good mix. There's only such thing in the real world when there's money to be made or productions to be done. Someone has to like the mix, and it's usually the artist, the producer, the manager. Someone is going to like it, and thus, the best objective mix is the their favorite subjective mix, if that makes sense. If the producer's big time in charge, then there's no point of mixing practice stems without someone to approve it. Because, like, what the only thing that makes a mix good is if they like it. You know, if they really like it. And then after they like it, then, then it could be like, okay, we could talk about objectively good mixes. Um, but at the same time, like, mixing in a void without client expectations or any sort of client approval um, is significantly less valuable from the from the perspective of practicing mixing than to like offer a free mix to a friend and have them give you feedback and give them a product that they really like that is such better practice as a mixer because or, and this goes for any sort of creative field like if you're a video editor or photoshop editor or something like that you know a graphic designer it you can make stuff sure right but 
at the end of the day, making something for a client is a different skill and it's better to practice that. You don't want to create in a void, practice in a void. That only goes so far. So if as much as possible, if you're going to practice mixing, it is better to ask a friend if you can mix their song for free for in exchange for the experience and for that added portfolio than it is to mix a song for free from a STEM practice website or something like that. You got to have that feedback. You got to appease someone that's the entire part of the i would say communication and references and like how what they like trying to figure out what the person wants is a significantly more valuable skill than knowing exactly how a compressor works uh, literally i have a manager right now and, and um he's like oh dk we love working with you and he's like he kind of glossed over. He's like, oh, because you're so easy to talk to. You're so quick on communication. You know exactly what the producer wants. Ah, la, la, la. Oh, also, you got the chops, too. Yeah. And it was like the fact that I was good at mixing was like the last thing on the list. And it was because I was such like there's no hassle. I'm easy to work with, easy to communicate with. I know exactly what they want. I'm able to turn things around really fast. You know, those are the things that really change and level up a mixer and it's 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 kind of difficult to gain that skill and understand how to mix quickly and and understand what a client exactly wants and to interpret it interpret the weird objective things that they're saying like like I want the music to sound more blue how do you interpret that unless you have a lot of experience under your belt and you kind of understand you listen to the song you you're know, like okay I think I know what they mean by blue or I think I know what's making them dizzy right with the example that we talked with Leslie Brathwaite so many times where all he did was turn off the auto pan on one of the tracks. Okay, number seven is uh, wimpy mix moves. This is a mistake that I see people make. Uh, there's a lot of people that do like too much mixing, like too much compression, too much EQ and whatnot. But I also see a lot of, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I also see a lot of like mixers that are fairly self-aware and they're just way wimpy. Like you're mixing like a bitch. And what I mean by that is like you want to cut something because you don't like the frequency, but you're already cutting at five dBs and you and you you heard or you feel like you're you feel like it's wrong if you cut more than that and you're like, ah, but I, I don't like what it sounds, but like I don't want to do more because I heard that if I do more, it's gonna hurt it. Don't be a bitch. I mean you you know what you like. And I would say that there's a lot of quality on the table that you're leaving if you don't do what you think is right and if that means cutting more than 5 dbs or having a wide cut rather than a bunch of small narrow cuts like do what you like do what sounds good and and that's <laughs> that's funny uh, do what sounds good right alex tume there um but i think that there's some people that do way too much but i think that in in that intermediate stage of plateauing I find a lot of people are just too afraid to do more. Their gut is telling them they don't want as much low mids in the vocal, but they're like, and no matter how much I cut the low mids, it's still too much, but like, I'm afraid to cut it more because I've already cut too much. Like it looks, the EQ looks crazy. The EQ already looks crazy. I'm, I, it's just visually, I just don't know what it is. Do, just go ahead and cut more. Um, do what sounds right. Don't worry about technically correct. Because I do really believe, I see that a lot of intermediate, especially intermediate mixers, where that is that is keeping them from progressing, that is keeping them from making a song sound better. And, and honestly, that has a sound. <laughs> Being a wimpy mixer has a sound. It feels, it sounds like you can't fully commit. And I want to be clear, like, it's okay if you do things that are odd or weird sometimes. Maybe not all the time, you're right? Maybe your gut is right sometimes. But at the same time, like, if you have enough self-awareness, then it's okay to do things and then recognize, okay, that was too much later. If you're able to recognize, okay, that was too much, I should dial back. It's okay to do too much. Figure out where the lines are, find the boundaries of what's acceptable, and keep moving forward. If you feel like you're plateauing in the intermediate level, that may be the biggest thing. Um, number, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Number eight is not bypassing your plugins. I think this is simple. I mean, don't put stuff on. This is kind of like the preset thing. Don't just put stuff on and leave it there. Like, make sure that it's actually happening. I know that you like to use this specific compressor on every single vocal. You love the CLA 76. Every single vocal. You love the RVox. Every single vocal. That's your go-to compressor. 
you should, even if it works, like, or you should bypass it. Like, you should find out if, in this instance, this might not be one of those one in ten or one in a hundred instances where it just doesn't work. How would you know unless you bypass it every single time? Not only does, not only does bypassing kind of put things back into perspective, especially in the digital domain, this was not something that was as easy in the analog domain. And it's it's a blessing for us that we can compare so easily, A, B, so easily when a compressor is toggled in and toggled out. That's it. It's so nice. And you can hear for yourself and decide for yourself, is this actually making things better? So make sure that you bypass. Number nine is very awesome. It's very simple. It's, it's overlooked all the time. I know that many producers talk about this is not trusting your gut, your inability to trust your gut. Now, this is important. I want to put it in perspective. I've I've heard Rick Rubin talk about it in, in these similar terms. But before any of us got into making music or producing or mixing music, before any of us got into it, we liked music. We still probably do like music. What that And even before we hit any sort of technical uh, verbiage that we were able to understand, like technical knowledge, we understood that we like these songs more than these songs. And we were able to say, I subjectively personally like these songs more than these songs i like the sound of these songs more than these songs even without any sort of technical knowledge you have preferences that means you have some baseline sense of taste now the problem is that when you're learning how to mix you have to learn the technical tools you have to learn what an eq does what it sounds like how it affects the sounds how you're going to use that tool same thing with compressors saturators modulation reverbs everything you have to figure out the technical usage of these tools and when you're going through the valley of technicality you're going to forget about your tastes you're going to forget that like Oh yeah, I'm using a compressor to make the drums punchier. I know that sounds so simple, but when you go through that beginner intermediate stage, you're going through the valley of technicality. Like it is until you get out of that valley and realize, okay, now the technical stuff, the compressors that I use, the harmonics, etc., the tools that I use, the technical tools that I use are so secondhand, like nature. It's so natural to me. Um, and it comes so easy to me, now I can think emotionally. And the tools become something that helps me translate my emotional tastes um, and be able to execute those through technical usage of these tools. This is something that, again, I think is a really easy mix mistake people are making all the time, is the importance of trusting your gut try things you can always bypass you can always undo try things if the snare doesn't sound quite right you want to change it out you want to do something you want to saturate you want to do something that is unnatural or not typical of a, of a classic it's not a classic peer-reviewed mix technique you know whatever uh go ahead and just try shit out Remember that, trust your gut. If your gut is telling you that you want more fatness in the drum or you want more of this or less of that, do it. Even if it is something that is not typical, trust your gut. The more that you trust your gut, the better experience you get. This is That specific advice is the most common and the most repeated advice from high-level mixers. When you're going from intermediate to advanced mixing, this is the secret sauce. Getting out of the valley of technicality and getting into that emotional awareness, that level of emotional awareness, awareness where the tools are only there to help you. The tools are only there to translate emotion. That's all it is. You're not there because the the tool it looks cool. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. I use plugins because they look cool sometimes. I use gear because they look cool, but um. Trust your gut. Do not be afraid to trust your gut. 11 is people are mixing too slow. People are mixing too slow. Uh, yes, I think that mixing too slow is going to kill your mix. I really do think so. Not only are you, if you're charging per song, not only are you making less per hour, but I genuinely think it's making your mix worse. The cool thing about mixing is that, I mean, with uh, inspiration, right? You want to be inspired. You hear a song, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to mix this to be so fire. You get so inspired. If you mix it for three days straight, 12 hours a day, that inspiration was gone by hour three, day one. 
Like that, you might get a little bit of that inspiration back at the beginning of each and every day. Well, you know, when you when you go to bed and you don't listen to anything for a little bit. But inspiration is fleeting. I'm going to say that again. Inspiration is always fleeting. So in order to keep and control that inspiration to stay inspired to be able to mix emotionally, you have to learn how to mix fast. I mean, we've seen professional Fortnite players and Apex players where they're like on their mouse and keyboard hitting like practice target shots. One misclick, like I'm dead serious, like I'm so dead serious. One misclick <laughs> can cause you to lose inspiration. One, one time that you didn't know a shortcut and instead you went through the menu and you had to use two brain cells to go through a menu instead of just na like natively just using a shortcut on the keyboard might be how you lose that inspiration. Just a little bit of inspiration might, it might be what it is. And it's usually a, lot, a little bit of inspiration stacked on top of each other that's going to make the song feel really inspired, feel expensive, feel really well put together, really thoughtful, whatever adjectives you use, whatever words you use to describe it. I, I do think that if you mix fast, not only are you going to potentially make more money per hour, right, and increase your level of income, be able to balance more work, um, and be able to manage more projects all at the same time, but I genuinely believe that if you practice mixing quickly, you'll be able to stay inspired longer, maintain objectivity I mean, maintain objectivity more during a larger percentage of the mix. And I think that your mixes are genuinely sound, going to sound better. There's ne there's almost never been a time where I've second-guessed my mix decisions, and I second-guessed it, so I changed it a little bit, and that sounded better. That's, like, never been a thing. If you ask any sort of mixer, very rarely does that happen. It's it's going to be, like, even if with, with Kanye, who, who took Manny to, like, 100, or, like, Michael Jackson, where he took... Um, oh man, I'm, I'm, uh, Bruce Swedeen through a hundred different revisions and goes back to mix two. <laughs> That's because they were inspired during the first couple mixes. You know, um, there's something people don't understand. Inspiration, inspiration is fleeting, mix faster. And I think that this is going to be something, not just something that you practice, but I think that like, if you are an old head and you're, or you're just not, you didn't grow up playing RuneScape. <laughs> I think that like going to monkey type and like practicing your typing, practicing like watching other people, like tracking, being in high pressure situations, literally getting used to a mouse. I think, I think that the, uh, the rolly mouse thing is way overrated. People are like, it oh, stops carpal tunnel. Well, listen, if you sit in a proper position with good posture in a chair where your armrests are the same level as the desk and they're never at a 90 degree, 90 degree angle or less, um, you're not going to get carpal tunnel. In fact, a rolly ball where you have to move your wrist every single time is going to get you more carpal It's literally less ergonomic for you. The only reason why those exist is because on consoles, they don't have enough space for a mouse movement, right? Rolly balls are way overrated. I challenge any professional engineer to fight me 1v1 on any sort of first-person shooter. You use the rolly ball, I'll use a mouse, and whoever's more accurate, I'm, I guarantee, and I will never lose. I, even against the best roller ball mouse person, I will never lose. And I seriously, having to think about the, the mouse and that roller mouse at all, if it's any sort of a barrier for you, then, then don't fucking use it. Don't fucking use it. <laughs> it's that simple. Like, even something as simple as that. Like, if you have shortcuts, I have macros on my keyboard. I have, like, shortcuts on my keyboard where um, I can compare rough mixes or reference mixes with a single button on my keyboard. That's custom keyboard nerdy shit we're not going to get into. But you want to take away any sort of resistance or barrier, things that are going to make you slower. And again, if that means practicing on monkey type, how to type in the names of your fucking plugins, because the search bar is so much faster than any sort of drag and drop. The search function is so much. If you're using Logic, there is a plug search app. You pay like 20 to 30 bucks. It's a no-brainer buy. You hit control and while you click on an insert and it lets you type in. Typing in the name of the plugin is so much fucking faster than scrolling, dragging and dropping, going through the developer names or the type of dynamic plugins and finding the fucking th No. I'm telling you, that sort of stuff, those like microseconds, those, those, the, the two or three seconds for each instance of a plugin that you're putting in when you don't type versus drag and drop is literally killing your inspiration. It's not just making you a slower mixer. It's, it's taking away brain power that could have been used to channel that inspiration that you're feeling.
You're wasting your time. And if people are wondering how I'm able to mix so fast, is because one, I always trust my gut. I'm never second guessing myself. I know exactly what to do. I know my tools really, really well. And I've used all of them so many times and done enough bypassing and comparing to know what they sound like and how they're gonna change the sound. I know what I want to begin with. I'm envisioning how I want the drums to sound. I know what tools will probably take me there. Sometimes I'm wrong and I have to switch out. I have to switch out the inserts, right? But the point is, there's no hesitation. It's all just, I just need to put in the hours, the work or whatever it is. And by the time you know it, I can mix a 150 song track confidently, send the mix one to the client in like two to four hours. And I know that's insane for most mixers, but if you focus, <laughs> I think that that is totally possible. Being able to spend eight to tell 12 hours on a song with 100, 150 tracks is a luxury that most people can't afford, shouldn't afford. That's a time when it's like, okay, I'm making enough money that I can spend, like I need to spend money on outboard gear as a tax write-off, okay, because I need new tools. Like when you're making so much money that you need to spend money for tax write-offs, that's when it's okay to start spending more time on a mix. Like, okay, I have, I have one high-end client that pays 1500 bucks a mix and I do two of those a week and I'm set for, you know, the month or whatever, two or three of those a week. I can spend a day and a half on each mix. Okay, cool. Take your time. But that, that even as a hobbyist, someone that doesn't have time pressures and time constraints as like a professional mixer, I'm telling you right now, mixing slow is hurting you so much. I'm not going to go on anymore. I've, I've already been going on with this. 12, 12, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, number, that was um, 11. Number 12 is too much processing. This is so simple. Um, if you have, if you're using all 10 inserts and then using another bus so you can use more 10 inserts, I mean, that's something that you should... I mean, you should you should think twice. Like, I mean, just make sure that it's actually helping. Uh, most of the time, it's not. I find myself doing this all the time too. Like, if you're over processing stuff, I mean, there's each time you put something on, you're adding noise, adding distortion. Excuse me, not as much as before. I mean, we're in digital, but you're adding distortion. You're changing the phase. It becomes less and less malleable for each instance, and it sounds less and less natural. Um, sometimes you like I've seen sessions where there's like ten plugins on a single on a single track, and then I bypass all of them, and it sounds better. You don't over, don't need to overprocess. If you really know what you want out of a out of a vocal, for example, or out of a snare, then it doesn't take that many inserts. Like you already know what you want. It's usually that overprocessing comes from not knowing exactly what you want and trying to figure shit out. That like you got to remember the most important part is knowing what a good snare drum sounds like, knowing what a good vocal sounds like. If you already know what you want, then use you'll need to use less tools. And also be aware the biggest most important skill to have is knowing when not to change something. You'll be surprised if you like again, go to my live streams. I'm, I might live stream more mixes in the future. Um, I'm just doing a lot of mixes where I can't live stream them. They're like label stuff. So I got, um, I, I can't, they're private right now. But uh, I do, um, if you, if I do ever do do a mixes in the future, like you'll be surprised how, how f many tracks I leave untouched. Like I just change the volume and the panning or if anything, zero everything out and that's it. Like that might be, that like I don't do anything. It's just like, oh, it sounds good as it is. Like being able to recognize when something sounds good without touching anything is an, a very, very important skill. Number 13, communication. Okay. Uh, I don't need to go on about this. What's making your mix suck is your inability to communicate. You're literally, your mixes are suffering because you have either one, a fucking ego, and you're unable to realize that the artist might be right, especially if they have feedback. I'm telling you right now, at the upper echelons of mixers there is very little to no ego if if you are getting paid by S sony you know universal atlantic republic whatever label and you fight back because you think you know more than the producer or the artist even if you actually do you're fucking getting fired like, you need to learn how to, one, I think communication goes into understanding that you're just a service, 
So when someone has feedback, it's not personal. And if you take feedback personally, you may need therapy because that's not normal, okay? It's not a personal thing. They just have different tastes and it is your job to align your taste to their tastes. It is not their job to understand that your taste is superior. That is not the artist's job. The artist's job is to say, hey, and you know what? This is something that is so funny. It's a great, great, uh, it's, this is something so funny. It sounds like the audio is dropping out on YouTube. Go to Instagram or to Twitch. Let me know if the audio is still dropping out on Twitch. But um, here's the thing that's so funny. I hear this all the time. I see this all the time on like Facebook forums. Is someone that's not making enough money from mixing to do full time. They're like, oh, I got some feedback and I really think that these revisions are really worse. I'm, I'm conflicted. I need some help, everybody. Can you, can you give, give me some contents? I don't want to put my name on this record because I don't want to tarnish my... Tarnish my rapport with this one single or this this album from this one local client nobody's ever heard of before oh my gosh that is you're fucking lame-o man grow oh man be an adult that is the most lame shit ever first off <laughs> if you're unable to accommodate them and make it sound good something's wrong with you okay that means you suck that's number one <laughs> And number two, you don't remember your place. Again, their job is not to make sure that you they know that you're, you're superior, your taste is superior. Your job is to accommodate their taste. And if you can't accommodate to their taste without making it sound good, I mean, uh, yeah. If you can't accommodate their taste without making it sound good, then something is wrong with you. You suck. Number two, let's talk about the actual practicality of that. You don't have to put every single song that you work on on your Spotify portfolio on your website. Who gives a fuck if that no if that local artist doesn't sound good and what they want? It, it does. You don't think it sounds good. Who gives a flying fuck? Because at the end of the day, what's going to get you more clients and get you more work is if they come out of that situation, even if the song sounds bad, if they come out of that situation totally raving about how easy you are to work with, how great you are to work with. Nobody gives a shit about how it sounds. I mean, that's like secondary to how easy you are to work with. If you ask anybody who's had a bad experience with a mixer, it's rarely ever, rarely ever that they can't get it to sound good. It's because they don't reply when they're supposed to do revisions. They don't reply to emails. There's no form of communication. That's 99% of why people have a bad experience with a mixer. So if you can let people have a great experience and you just hold your fucking pride and your tongue and you don't say shit out of pocket, and you remember your place, there's a level of humility, then you're going to do so well. There's going to be more, more, more word of mouth, more potential work. There's going to be less friction. And guess what? You don't have to work with them ever again. If, it didn't, if you didn't enjoy it, then you can, you can either raise your price to ridiculous levels for them and... and you know, so they don't ever hire you again or they have more better expectations to begin with. But it's usually some level of expectations that you didn't set in the beginning anyway. Like if they don't think that you're the goat mixer before you even started, there was no communication to begin with. Like that's why managers are so good because managers kind of talk you up. Like it's a third party person that's talking you up and they think that you're the man before you even start a session. That goes a long way. Like talking to them, making sure that the artist, like if you take them out to lunch and you listen to them and you kind of under try to really understand what they're going for, try to truly understand what their tastes are. And if they start to feel like you're on their team, like totally on their team, and if they start to feel like you're really in it for them, they're going to have less feedback. They're going to really, their expectations are going to be different. They're going to remember, oh yeah, we're on the same team. We both want this record to sound good. Mixes are going to sound better to them. They're going to be happier. It's literally just communication. I think that's another point that we're going to get into later. Um, number 14 is to keep improving. Uh, even even multi-Grammy winning mixers, master engineers, like we still have breakthroughs all the time. Like, oh my gosh, this sounds better. Oh my gosh, this sounds better. They're doing this. I can't believe I haven't been doing this this entire time. It is important to always be improving. If you are plateauing or you feel like you're just the goat and there's no way that you can improve because you've hit a ceiling, that's there's something wrong. I, I think it's fair to say like the humility that comes with it, uh, that comes with understanding that you may be really good, but you, you have a lot more to go is super important. I think that's just so straightforward. Um... I, in fact, I'm going to replace number 14 with this. And this is so controversial, but I talked about it once. 
in the episode about loudness, I'm going to reemphasize this. Almost never should you submit a mix, even if it's going to go to a mastering engineer, almost never should you emit, submit a mix without a limiter on the end. Like, you don't want to submit quiet mixes. Again, I know, I know, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, I know that people are like, don't make things too loud, and a lot of people have an ego about loudness or whatever. It's going to hurt you if... Because the clients, they're not engineers. They're, cons they're, they're typically consumers most of the time, right? And so they're, they're going off the sound of does it sound good from a consumer baseline level. And loudness affects that way more than we think. What I'm not saying is take it to minus 0 0.4 LUFS, which is, I, that's a story for another time that I discovered this last week. Um, what I am saying is just put a limiter at the end when you're delivering things. And if you need to send another for the mastering engineer, then take off the limiter, send it for the mastering engineer. Loud, and literally one of my students who is doing really well in India, shout out to you, Pixel. We did a lesson together and he's like, I cannot get over like these revisions, these clients revisions. They're like, it's just not making sense. I, I don't know what it's happening. I was looking at the revision request and I was able to interpret. I think they just want this to be louder. They didn't say louder at any point, but through the interpretation from experience, right? Working with clients all the time. I'm like, hey, just can we sacrifice one revision? You know, you might have to do another mix after this, but just as a test, can we see if this all could be resolved? by making it fucking loud, like a lot louder. He was submitting these mixes at what, minus 10, minus nine LUFS for like a hip hop track. And we got it to like minus seven, minus eight, just a little bit louder, not super loud, but just a little bit louder. And okay, it is pretty loud. Um, but we get it to that level. The client loved it, no revisions. That's the only thing that we changed. It's insane to me. Like it's insane to me how well that worked. Um, and regardless of how you feel about loudness or the technicality of the physics of audio and music and, and naturalness, um, humans are humans. And loudness is something that is a tool that you should use to win over clients. Now, I think that you shouldn't overcompensate with loudness. But just remember, um, if you're submitting mixes that aren't loud enough, I think that that is hurting you. And there's... Um, I think that you should submit louder mixes, even within normalization standards now. Uh, number 15, the last thing. I say this all the time. Don't negate experience. It's not, it's not how you use a compressor. It's not the EQ and the tools that you have. It's not Ableton versus Pro Tools versus Logic. It is literally just experience. You get faster, you maintain objectivity, you learn your tools better, you fulfill, you understand and are able to interpret clients better, you understand the communication style, how to balance project management, how to balance between projects. All of this stuff improves with experience over time. There's a reason why the masters at their crafts have been doing this for decades. There's never been a master at mixing that has developed within the first decade of their career. Like, you don't get legendary status of mixer in the first decade of your career. That is so far and few between. It, this is a difficult enough skill that even with a decade or two of experience, you may not ever become a master. Like, this is... Don't think that you mix for six months to two years and all of a sudden you're the GOAT. That's not how this works. Do not negate experience. And it's hard to kind of communicate how much better you can be until, until it's like in hindsight. Like every year you should be looking and see like in hindsight, oh my gosh, I knew nothing last year. Like that's how it's going to feel every single year and that's how it should every single year. So that means you're on the right path. Don't negate experience. Be patient with yourself. Be loving to yourself. Um... Understand that this is all a process to trust the process. And as long as you are focused and maintain passionate and love, honestly, the best mixers out there, the best producers out there, they maintain something that most people lose during their career, which is the, the absolute baseline passion for good music. So as long as you maintain that, just enjoy the process. Don't overthink shit. Just, just remember that you love music and you're here to help create the thing that you love. Uh, you know, then I think that that is going to translate into improvement overall. There's some things that you should focus on while improving, right? Like if you're 
taking surfing lessons, for example, like the pop-up, you know, getting from on your chest to on your feet, like that's a specific asset aspect that you should train and focus on for a while. But eventually, like, that becomes something you don't even think about. And you just get better overall. You start to feel the wave better. How do you how do you how do you explain to a, a noob surfer to start feeling the wave? It just takes experience. Like when I talk about saturation and compression and they're like, why did you do that? And, I, and a lot of the times the answer is, I don't know, it just felt right. That's the, that's the equivalent of like a pro surfer being like, just feel the wave and you can feel which way it's turning and, and how, how much you should drop in and being at, you know, how much speed you should maintain. And it's the exact same thing. Like you just got to feel it. And that feeling doesn't come from just being on the waves all the time. Being on the waves all the time. Like, so it's just bit by bit. Be patient with yourself. You know, you're, you're not a God. <laughs> you're human. And it's all just a bunch of humans making music. And that's what makes music so great. And that's why I'm so optimistic about AI. Because no matter how good AI sounds, it's <laughs> I think humans will always prevail. We can, we understand, we have perf we have empathy, we have sympathy, you know. So um, we need a lot more of that in our mixing than technicality. If you mix technically, uh, I think that you should take the next step, which is start to mix emotionally. All right. I think that's it for this episode. Uh, let's do a couple shout outs. Shout out to FilePass, actually. FilePass. I love FilePass. That's what I use for billing clients and transferring files. Do I need to say less? Do I need to say more? FilePass is awesome. It's basically Dropbox, but for audio. And it's very specific to audio. There's a lot of really cool features. Uh, MixingMusicPodcast.com slash FilePass. We're sponsored by Tegler. They're having an awesome sale right now. I won't even get into it. I'm about to buy some two more pieces of Tegler gear. Uh, love Tegler's stuff. Uh, MixingMusicPodcast.com slash Tegler. What else? What else? Anything. Free resources and PDFs. MixingMusicPodcast.com. And if you like this sort of content and you want twice as many episodes every single week go to mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive for exclusive content where i release two more exclusive episodes hidden behind a paywall every single week so that means three episodes a week rather than one and so that is awesome me and Braden kind of break down different things and we break down interviews from other producers other engineers and we kind of go further into explaining why that's good advice or why it's bad advice it's fantastic episodes i'm really proud of those we got a lot of listeners and subscribers um, to join the club MixingMusicPodcast.com slash exclusive. That is $4 a month or $40 a year. $4 a month is less than the price of a cup of coffee for way good knowledge that can actually help you make more money. It's better than coffee because coffee doesn't make you, maybe it makes you money. I don't know. It gets you hyped up. Makes you a better, <laughs> a better mixer. I don't know. Um, but uh, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. Okay. Uh, how about that? How was that? That was good. It looks like I got some text from people. All right. All right, I'm going to keep going, do one more episode. I want to do one about AI. I kind of don't want to do one about AI, but... Um, I'm, I think I'm going to save the mistakes. We want to do like 10 mistakes between Lou and I. We want to do one where it's like 10 mistakes. Hold on one second. We're going to eventually do an episode about like 10 times we fucked up. Uh, five pivot points. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I think... Uh, uh, shout out to James, if you're still watching James. Is the audio still cutting out on YouTube? James. Is the audio... If not, we're going to keep going. I don't know what's going on with YouTube. You buy a nicer computer just to for it to keep cutting out. I don't understand. Um, but we're going to move forward. 
is AI a good topic? Everybody, everybody afraid of AI mixing, AI mastering? I'm going to talk about why it's okay. Why it actually might help. Let's get some comments. Is that, is that something that we're interested in learning about? If not, I can do a different topic. There's a lot of other topics that we can do. Um, give it another, I'm going to let it all catch up for another 10 seconds here. 10, 20 more seconds. How's AI? AI is a topic. Why AI is good. Ooh. Okay. And these are both topics that, um, it's less important that I have. There's other topics that I really need Lou for. So these are topics I can just knock out as well since he's not here today. Hello and welcome back to the Mix of Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and today the episode is all about AI. Now, before you sign off, before you switch episodes, I'm going to tell you this episode is all about why AI is good, why it can potentially make you more money, and why we should choose to embrace this. Now, I want to kind of separate this topic into historical facts about change and about new technology but as well as specific uses and specific changes i'm going to talk about like economics a little bit some just like basic economics and principles in that sense um and as well as just practical usage of the tools now here's the thing i am very optimistic about ai and i think that you should be too i think most people are not optimistic about ai simply because it's change historically that has always been the case people are always historically afraid of change even when it comes over <laughs> this is, i'm not never mind i'm gonna i'm gonna hold my tongue um even with using computers something is using computers or switching to emails instead of letters you know things like that uh, people are always resistant to change. That is something that is human, and uh, it's part of our genetic code <laughs> to to a certain degree. We're afraid of change. Of course, we we don't know. There's uncertainty. We're we're supposed to kind of protect ourselves from uncertainty. It makes total sense. But I'm going to tell you why AI is great. Let's first start off from a objective historical point of view. Anytime that there's any sort of big change in technology and there's some sort of technological advancement it is those who adapt early and quickly that are able to profit the most off of new technology if you were to if you were i mean now this is no financial advice but when you got into if you were getting into bitcoin you know in the mid to late even early 2010s i mean that paid off that fucking paid off you get into it late yeah you're fucking whatever you've lost it so it's a good, I mean, that's just one example. If you get into computers early, then there's more job opportunities. You know how to use Microsoft early. Then like that got into jobs. Literally, my dad had his, his, built his career off of just learning computers early. If you, get into, if you get into music early, you know, the younger you get into, if you adapt and change to, to digital workflows early, you know, um, that changes. It's an advantage for you. It's easier to monetize because then... Most, I hate to say this, but most old heads are reluctant for new technologies. So uh, that being said, statistically speaking, I know I know this because I run a podcast marketing firm. Um, statistically speaking, if you listen to podcasts, then you are statistically much more likely to adapt and and um, adopt new technologies sooner than everybody else. You're also statistically a lot likely to be higher educated and uh, higher income. Although this is a music podcast, so I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's talk about AI and why I think you should be optimistic. The first thing that I want to talk about is a couple things that I think, the reason why I think AI is super important is because what AI does, for example, AI mastering, which is objectively sucks, like the sound of it sucks. Um, but what it does is it allows, it allows people that were probably not going to pay for your services anyway because they're, they don't have enough budget to pay for a human to begin with. It allows them to get baseline mastering done, which does two things. 
One, it brings attention to the importance of mastering. They're like, oh my gosh, mastering is genuinely important. And number two, it brings, it brings to attention the importance and the quality of the mastering. So not only are people realizing, oh my gosh, mastering was something that I didn't even know what mastering was, but now I'm realizing the importance. I can hear the difference. I'm like, okay, I need to do mastering. Everybody, That's why my music was so quiet before is because I didn't know what mastering was. And then it becomes, hey, uh, yeah, like, we need to master this song and now I'm starting to be able to tell what's better than the others because I've done it enough times. Um, so they're going to increase their budgets for mastering as they increase their own earnings, their own wages. Um, typically if you stick with clients for decades, they start making more money, you know, over the course of time. So they have bigger budgets for things or they prioritize music more. And so they dedicate more money to their music. So uh, again, uh, allowing for bigger budgets. So number one, is I think it brings a lot of much needed attention to mixing and mastering. I mean, if you ask any artist about what mixing or mastering was 10, 20, or maybe, maybe not 10 years ago, but 20, 30 years ago, they, they probably wouldn't know. The average, the average artist would have no idea. They just know that there's some magic going on. They need a console and there's some faders. They're just balancing some things out. Now it's just like expected, like even producers, it's just expected that they're going to get some back end points. They might be able to get the, the beat for free for in exchange for back end points until, or like a really discounted beat until they make enough money from the back end points. And then, then they, they could take 50% of the song until they make $5,000 or whatever from the song. Um, it's really interesting because, uh, even with producers, but with now with mixers and even mastering, it's just like a, I don't know how to say in English and like a, what we say in Japanese, like an atarimae thing, like an, like an obvious thing. Like, yeah, everybody's going to pay for a mixer. Everybody's going to pay for a mastering engineer. Yeah. Like that's not, you, you don't even c consider that to be an option as much of a produ as much as a producer. <laughs> so it's like people are more likely to produce their own shit than the mix their own shit. Like it, it's because, yeah, it's just like, it's thanks to kind of celebritizing bringing forward the importance of mixing by tools. The more accessible something is, the more important people are going to realize it is. They're like, okay, I got a taste of it. They get some AI mixing tools. They get a taste of what a good mix sounds like. They're like, oh my gosh, this changes everything. And you're saying that I can make this even better when a human does it? I think that's going to be great. I think it also removes, it, it automatically does a lot of qualifying. I, if you don't have the budget to hire a human being, it's probably, I shouldn't be complaining as a mixer. Like I charge this much monies to mix a song. And if, and if an AI tool that does significantly worse than I do, it just, uh, is, is a quarter of the cost or, or less than 10% of the cost. They probably weren't my client to begin with as a white glove service. You know, that's what I am. I'm a white glove service, a high price, very custom, specific needs, specific deliverables, specific revisions and requests. You can't get that with AI. And if they aren't looking for that type of service to begin with, why are you, try why are you trying to sell someone a McLaren when they just want a Civic? It doesn't make sense. Like, they're not your customer. Why, why are you being bitter about someone buying a Civic when you're work for fucking Rolls Royce. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't be bitter or jealous about the Civic sales. Of course there's going to be more Civic sales. Of course, it's, it's easier, accessible. People just don't care. But the people that didn't care weren't your clients to begin with. So I don't think we're losing anything. In fact, I think we're gaining potential clients because, again, it brings to attention the importance and the value of good mixing. Okay? I, I definitely think that's very important. I think practical usage for us, I think that us as mixers and as mastering tools, I mean like Ozone's auto mastering and, and the really glitchy auto mixing and stuff, I think those will eventually become tools that mixers will use. Again, there's with AI, there's some level of human input that needs to be going on, especially at this point. Not only do we need to know how to input that stuff, but we also need to know how to utilize that stuff. For example, maybe AI can draw a hummingbird, but you're going to have to kind of, you get, you, you're able to, 
sketch out a hummingbird with AI, but then you have to do it by hand to make it look better, right? So you're able to kind of bring out ideas faster, kind of test ideas and like, oh, okay, actually I don't like that. And then you just do the, once you figure out what idea you like, it can, can accelerate the idea process, the ideating process, and actually lengthen the actual creation process with, uh, or not lengthen, shorten the actual creation process um, and make that time more effective with better direction, more focused. I think that eventually, um, even now with things like Bounce Butler and Adam Shep's Bounce Factory, whatever it is, um, even assistants are getting more mixing jobs rather than bouncing jobs because there's less needs for bouncing and it gets assistants a better chance. At the same time, there's less need for an assistant, so they're assistants, so there's something to say about that as well. I do think that AI, if we use correctly, I think in our world of stuff is a tool. And if I hear I do think that there are, there may, I don't know yet. I, I don't think any of us knows, but I do think, I want to validate the fears that people have of, especially like with the strikes going on, um, the validate the fear of AI taking jobs. I think that that is valid. I think that as we automate, and this is not just AI, this has been for everything, right? Elon Musk has talked about, Elon talked a lot about how everything's going to be automated eventually. And that's going to be a big risk is we need to create some baseline rules and stuff for what, where humans should take place and where we shouldn't take away jobs. But I don't think that that affects our industry as much. And I think there's a, there's a documentary I was watching about the strike or like some news article or something that I was watching. And there was a very passionate endorser of the strike who basically said, people say that AI tools are going to help us to be more efficient. And then I don't remember the exact wording, but she basically said, those people who think that are, are baseline, just borderline stupid. They, they, there's no time that a machine should ever be better than a human. And that those, there's never going to be a tool. It's either going to be us or them. And I think that that is the most low IQ argument I've ever heard. And I think that it's important for us to accept this new technology find that it's inevitable because it is and figure out ways to utilize that to increase the level of our artwork and people are already doing that people are significantly or already doing that and it's scary because we have to learn a new skill but if we learn that new skill i think it'll come to our advantage it'll be to our advantage do not be afraid of ai i really do think that it helps a lot and i really hope that y'all are able to overcome your fears to increase your earning, increase your wages, and to um, get more clients, honestly. Let it sift out the bad clients for you. Let it help bring good clients to you. Let it continue to bring attention to the importance of our side of the music industry. Because, I mean... <laughs> Man, there was not this many jobs and this much money to be made as a mixer 20 years ago. There was not. This side of the industry has exploded. Has exploded in the last 20 to 30 years. I haven't even been around that long and I've seen it explode around me. Like, there's no 20, 20 year old, but you know, no nothing college graduate that was able to make any kind of money from mixing without proper internships and education and mentorships there was it was not possible a few decades ago a couple decades ago and here we are people have prioritized there's a lot more money to be spent per capita on mixing and mastering than there has ever been and that's thanks to more accessible tools honestly i really do believe so so i think that's it for this episode i'm going to keep it real short i think that um, you shouldn't be afraid of ai i think i've kind of got to the juice of it i think that some fears are valid but again if you can adapt adapt i mean it's always adapt or die right but if you can figure out a way to adapt and utilize these tools for your for your business i think it'll help you along the way a lot it'll help you so much so on that note thank you to our sponsors to tegler to autotune to file pass to sweetwater if you'd like to purchase anything use the sweetwater link below that really kicks back a little bit of money to our way and that helps a lot so thank you so much uh, and on that note happy mixing my friends and stay saucy that was a short episode that was a short episode all right uh I think that's it from my end.
Yeah, actually, an analogy episode would be great. Yes, yes. Okay, where are you guys go? The wedding going off? Is there a list of skills to this? I don't know, but I just kind of buy it less than a few things because I'm not really paying attention to it. Oh, I'm Where are you going? Um, Bye boys. Bye bye. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on next week. These episodes are going to come out tomorrow and next week. All right. Let me go back to the music here. <laughs> Oh, yeah.